webinar for March. Our topic today is discussing the services offered by Key Pro to our OHP members who are on fee for service. So, uh, with me in the room, we have. Uh, I'm Jeff McWilliams. I'm the medical director for Key Pro here in Oregon. Good morning, this is Maggie Klein, and I am the Director of Clinical Operations for KeyPro in Oregon. And these lovely folks will be our presenters today. Okay, so we're ready to start, and yeah, please, um, please do enter your questions in the chat. We'll stop from time to time, but um, I prefer this to be more interactive right. than than didactic anyway. So um, I'm gonna start um, and then I'm gonna give you a background of who we are and what we do and then uh, then Maggie will take over and talk more about the clinical specifics um, and, and uh, then we'll answer your questions as we go along. So our objectives today are to tell you about who we are and who we serve, how we serve them, let you know how to get us involved and how to contact us. So next slide, please. So um, KeyPro, I did not name this company. Um, KeyPro is short for Keystone Peer Review Organization. The history of the company is that it was started by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Um, and that's where the Keystone word comes from. So Pennsylvania is the Keystone state. Um, and uh, it was started as a peer review organization, which is an organization that that um, looks at the work of other physicians and healthcare uh, providers uh, in order to determine appropriateness. Over time, it became so big that it was spun off as its own company. And so from the early days when it was in Pennsylvania, it's now in uh, many US states. I think it's 35 or 36, mm -hmm. and uh, three of the US um, Territories. I couldn't think of that word. Um, and one of those sites is, of course, here in Portland. There are about a thousand employees in Keypro nationwide, and so it's a pretty big operation. And if you look at all the members who are served in one way or another by Keypro, it's about 82 million people in the U.S. Um, so Keypro itself, uh, including us here in Oregon has uh, several functions and services that, that we provide. We provide case management. Um, we provide targeted or specialty case management, utilization management, which is just a fancy way of saying prior authorizations, um, chronic care management, quality oversight and external quality review, independent medical reviews and peer reviews, which I uh, spoke about already. So we can go to the next slide and get a little more personal and drill down to Oregon. Um, all of the contracts that KeepRo has in Oregon are with the Oregon Health Authority. Um, just to make matters more complicated, we call ourselves the Oregon Health Plan Care Coordination Program right. here in Oregon, or OHPCC. Part of the reason that it got a different name is that when we first started this, we were part of a company called APS Healthcare. And as you can imagine in Oregon, if you called somebody and said you were from APS, they thought you were from a different agency, namely Adult Protective <laughs> Services. So we needed, we needed a different name. And uh, so the OHPCC has stuck. And you'll see at the end, if you would like to, would like to get to our website, it's actually ohpcc.org um, and not keypro.com, which will get you there too, but you have to go through a bunch of clicks. So, so I apologize for that uh, confusion. In Oregon, we do care coordination. We do care coordination for both physical medical problems and behavioral medical problems. We do case management. We do prior authorizations for uh, medical care as well as uh, psychiatric care and also uh, prior authorization for certain types of, of behavioral health placements. Uh, where the independent qualified agent for behavioral health, which as you may know, uh, the federal government requires that reviews for behavioral health be done by a third party that is independent and has no financial interest in the outcomes. And, um, and Keepro is that party for the state of Oregon. 
We do discharge planning and uh, concurrent review of admissions at the Oregon State Hospitals. And we also do what we call treatment episode monitoring for behavioral health, which is really another word for compliance monitoring, go in to the different um, behavioral health programs and make sure that our members are getting the services that they need. Uh, we have people all across the state. We have nurses embedded um, in Hermiston, in Eugene, um, in Salem, basically all across the state, and social workers out in the field. Physically, we're in West Lynn, just off the 205, in a relatively small office, since most of our people want to be out with all of the members. So, um, and as you've already heard, we serve the fee-for-service Oregon Medicaid population. And that includes people who are pure fee-for-service or who are dual Medicare fee-for-service members. Um, we do not service, um, we do not offer services to people who are in CCOs. Their case management is done by their individual CCO. And we also do not do case management for fee-for-service Native American Alaska Native members. Those are actually served through a different contract through Care Oregon, and that can be very confusing. It can be confusing for us, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure from time to time it'll be confusing for you. We, as I've already mentioned, we serve residents who are in licensed behavioral health beds and civilly committed individuals at the Oregon State Hospital. I think I misspelled civilly. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about the, the misspelling. <laughs> so um, uh, you guys are probably all over this and know this, but. Um, these are rough numbers, round numbers, but there are approximately 1.3 million Oregonians um, who receive Medicaid services. Um, the, most of them are serviced through CCOs, and that's the gray part of this big pie chart. And we're the uh, orange piece of pie there that are the fee-for-service members. In total, we manage about 120,000 of the Medicaid population in Oregon, so about 10%. Even though we're technically not a CCO, if you place us by numbers alongside the 15 CCOs that are now um, operating, we're actually the second largest here. Only one mm -hmm. larger is health share mm -hmm. of Oregon. So um, we jokingly call ourselves a CCO for people who don't have a CCO, because in a lot of ways we do the same thing. Exactly. Uh, um, and then this is where our fee-for-service members are, and they're, the point of this graph or this graphic is that they're all over the state. It's probably not surprising that the most populous parts of the state also have the most fee-for-service members, with perhaps the exception of Klamath County, which isn't very populous, but, but we right. have quite a few fee-for-service mm -hmm. members in that part of the state. Um, and again, we have uh, nurses embedded throughout the state. Why don't I uh, stop there and see if there have any if there are any questions or any questions that come in? So go ahead and type your questions in, folks, if you have any at this time. And again, please feel free to to type in your questions in real time as well. All right, well, um, okay. would, it, would it tell us if somebody's yes. typing? Okay, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll go on. And by the way, I don't think this will take the whole 90 minutes unless, unless we uh, have a lot of stuff to discuss. Sure. So a little more on what we do for care coordination services here in Oregon. Um, our fee-for-service members have access to a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, nurse advice line. So our members can call at any time to get help. Um, and if there's just the one telephone number that you'll see at the end, if it's during regular working hours, that rings in our office. And as Maggie may talk about, we, we always have at least one nurse in the office that can answer questions. If it's after hours, same phone number, and it rings to a, a 24 hour nurse advice line. Does that mean somebody asked a question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think there is a question. Okay, Great excellent. Question. We're going to, thank you. Um, so the question is, I'm a new assister, and how do fee-for-service members find out about this service, or are they assigned to Keypro? Um, perfect question, and I should have said that at the beginning, and it is in one of these slides, but it's better to talk about it now. 
Um, what, what happens is whenever a person is a new fever service member, we are informed, we get what we call an eligibility file every week from the Oregon Health Authority, and we identify anybody who is new on that list, and we send out uh, what's called a welcome packet, which includes information about um, who Kefro is and what we do um, and how to get a hold of us. Uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, paperwork or the information that goes to folks who are fee-for-service when they originally enroll in Medicaid, there's also a small amount of information about how to get a hold of case management services with Kefro. In addition to the mailer, we also uh, reach out to all new people by telephone. Um, so we hope to catch them one way or the other and let them know about our services. Um, the case management for fee-for-service is a voluntary service, and that's by federal mandate. So some people will opt out of care coordination when we contact them, uh, but others will agree to participate. Um, so I'll, going back to care coordination, and if we didn't answer your question, please say, I didn't answer my question. Um, so we talked about the nurse advice line. Uh, we offer care coordination services for all fee-for-service members throughout the state. We're going to talk a little bit more about all the different things that encompass what we call care coordination. Uh, we provide health coaches and uh, nursing coaches to the fee-for-service members to help with <clears throat> condition management, illness management, disease management, social situation management, um, health literacy, et cetera. Um, uh, I already talked about we get this eligibility file that tells us about new members. We also find new members uh, when they are admitted to a hospital. As you well know, sometimes people are admitted to a hospital who have no coverage and are placed on fee for service. Um, we have a, a service uh, from a company called Creative Medical Technologies that's called PreManage that lets us know that. Um, the state of Oregon is generously uh, paid for that so that we can know in real time. Uh, if there's a new hospital patient and our nurse in the field can go out and see that person face to face. Uh, we also like to identify the people who have the most need by an algorithm that we call the Percolator, which is a software program that if you're interested, I can get really geeky about and tell you about. But, um, and then we talk about outreaching members and we provide a plan of care consistent with the member and his or her provider. Um, some of the things we really try to target are medication compliance, exercise, diet, helping with making appointments, education, and more. Um, and then we also provide resource assistance to members uh, in the community for things like transportation, helping them find a doctor, a specialist, helping them make appointments, and we can get into that in more detail. So I'm gonna pause because it looks like there's another question. Oh, lots of questions, I love it. I'm fading in and out. Okay, I, I will I'll talk loud because I, I'm doing that thing about looking around the room and I shouldn't because it gets me away from the microphone. I apologize, Patricia. Um, so Keypro currently does not provide, so I'm sorry, I should say the question, shouldn't I? Because not everybody can see it. So Mary Young asked if Keypro actually provides authorization for DMAP patient surgeries. One of the services that we do provide for the state is prior authorization services. However, at this moment, we are not doing prior authorization for patient surgeries. That's only being done by the prior authorization department nurses at the Oregon Health Authority. We were doing that and we will do it again, but the OHA asked us to come off of that project to help uh, to help uh, catch up on a backlog of what, what are called claims determinations for the, the CALM population. Um, and so Maggie and her group have been uh, looking at some 3,000 of those claims while we're not doing the patient surgeries. We hope to be doing those again soon. Uh, the next question was from Teresa. Do you send out brochures to community partners to have on hand? Um, we, what we do, uh, what we try to do um, is actually physically meet with community partners and give them brochures. Uh, our nurses in the field, uh, not, we always, re we require them to do so many community outreaches a month and they always do way more than they're required. And so 
we certainly could send them by mail. Sure. Um, we've just always done it face to face. So hmm. if if um, if you know places that would be help that we don't know about, um, we are always welcome. Uh, we're open to any suggestions. So I think what we could do then potentially is hook our regional outreach coordinators up with the local nurses and right. maybe oh, invite them to our, our regional meetings that happen. I think that'd be a great Perfect. Place. And, and they would be excited to be there. Great. Um, so Teresa also asked, is this a service members can use while they are open card awaiting the CCO? Um, absolutely. That's a, a lot of our people, as you know, are exempt from CCOs and their fee for service forever. But a good half of our people come in fee for service and go out CCO. And um, sometimes they come back fee for service and we, we just, we take all comers. So yes, even if they're only on open card for a day, we provide them with that service. Well, and I think related to that, if I may, is that if we have someone who's in case management who's open card, who then moves to the CCO, we will help facilitate a warm handoff to the CCO for continuity of care. Thank you. Well. Thanks, Mandy. Yeah, please interrupt at any yeah. time. Um, and then Olivia asked if community partners can make referrals for case management, even if a client opts out, can a referral from a community partner reopen the case? Yes, we we happily take referrals from community partners um, and community agencies. And yes, uh, opt outs can always be reversed. If a person opts out today, she might need us next month, and you can call us and say that you know Miss Jones would really like to be involved now. And, and we can get involved. It's not, it, an opt out is, is never permanent. It's not engraved in stone. And if I could just add to that, so if it's a brand new referral, then my email is at the end of this slide set and those can just be emailed to me. And then I facilitate with our supervisor of case management, looking at the geographic location and the expertise, and then we assign the appropriate case manager. If it's someone that a um, community partner maybe has worked with before because they've been in case management and they're aware, they can also reach out locally to the case manager because they would have developed that relationship. Great. And these are great questions, yeah. you guys. Thank you. This is exactly what we were hoping for because <laughs> nobody wants a lecture. Yeah. Okay, so Mark is asking, since all new people are on open card until assigned to a CCO, do you wait a few weeks before sending a packet so as not to confuse clients? Great question. If not, an enrollee could receive a packet from you and then from the CCO. Since all new people are an open card until assigned to CCO, do you wait a few weeks? Oh, oh it's, um, it, got, it got repeated. That's exactly what we do. So it turns out that there, there is a bit of a lag uh, between the time that a person is enrolled into Medicaid, which as Mark points out, would, they would be as a fee for service, mm -hmm. and we get that person on the eligibility file. Um, and that that lag, even though we get a file every week, that lags about three weeks. And so as, well, the first thing that happens before a packet is sent out is that eligibility is reconfirmed. Um, thankfully, a computer does that for us. Um, but uh, so, so there is a possibility that could happen, but we try really hard to keep that from happening because I know that would, I would confuse the heck out of me. So. Um, and then Alma asked, is there a case manager for Malheur County? So do you want to take that, Maggie, sure. and tell her how so we do that? We have case managers assigned to every county in the state. Some of our case managers um, are in specific cities. For example, Jeff mentioned we have one in Hermiston. We actually have one in Bend. Um, we have one down in the Lane County area, one in Marion County. But they have geographic assignments. So it may be that their home base is um, Hermiston, but they cover all of that southeastern, or I'm sorry, yes, northeastern corner of the state. Mm -hmm. So we look at that geographic assignment. And so yes, Malheur County is covered by a nurse case manager. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, uh, and then, um, oh, how do we find out who is assigned to our area? Um, I can provide that information if you have specific questions for your area. My email is at the end, but it's simple, mkline at keepro.com, and um, we can provide that information for you. Um, oh, 
You're welcome. Um, Alma. <laughs> so Teresa asked about uh, is the service available to CalM members? So as you all know uh, better than I do, that uh, there's CalM and then there's CalM X. Um, so CalM X is uh, CalM members who are currently pregnant. Our service is available to currently pregnant moms who are CalM, but our service is not available to the regular CalM population. I wish it were. Um, when CalM people call us, we still help them the best we can. Um, we still connect them with nurses. We, we don't ever hang up on anyone, even when CCO people call. Um, but unfortunately, as far as case management, we can't do that with the regular CalM members. We're gonna, um, and there's a transition, as you know, going on right now about cover all kids. Um, and cover all kids are being transitioned to CCOs. In the last few days that we have them, um, we've been doing, the, the services are available to the cover all kids population. Um, and then Aaron asked, do your case managers ever refer to local case managers who do home visits to clients? For example, most health departments have home visiting programs that serve pregnant clients and children. Right, that is a great question. Thank you, Aaron. And so our role of our case managers is to really help to cocoon the individual and by that, I mean we look at what are the other agencies that are involved in their particular care that's being delivered, and they reach out and develop those relationships with those other case managers um, that allows them to really determine who best to serve the individual at that particular site. So say, for example, um, our nurse is located in Bend but has a patient in Klamath Falls. You know, is it for her to go there or is there a local case manager who's able to be boots on the ground and be there? So they work very collaboratively and that's our goal. So we follow up there and said that um, I don't think we've ever gotten a referral. So we could uh, we could get in touch with Aaron offline and, and, right. and get get the communication and, starting between Yeah, and you identify and, where she's at and yeah. and how to facilitate that. I think a great example is some of our medical fragile children. So we work with MSCU and um, the local area um, providers to identify what are those overall needs. We had a very complex case out of the Lane County area where our case manager um, worked with um, MSCU, they worked with local health department people, we look, worked with health, uh, local authorities. Um, because of the complexity of that family dynamic and really trying to bring everyone together in care conferences to address the overall needs for that individual. And um, it looks like Erin is in Bend and um, ah, I'm sure that Joanna, Joanna Cashman, Cashman. Cashman would love to talk to you. She's, she's outstanding. She's, a, she's an amazing nurse. She has a great way about her and she is a um, yoga instructor, but that's the wrong word. She's like a super instructor. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah. She's, <laughs> a yoga, super instructor. Wait, she's like a yoga, a yogi, I guess is what they're called. And I don't a know. wonderful case manager. Yeah. So Erin, uh, you'll see my email at the end. If you would send me an email later today, I will personally connect you with uh, Joanna. And um, yeah, and it, I only said the thing about yoga because she's calm through everything. <laughs> she is. <laughs> So, okay, and Mary Young, you get the you get the prize for today because you asked the Holy Grail question, which is, are you able to help DMAP patients find a dental provider? Um, yes, but I have my my hair is starting to thin because of trying to find dental providers and pulling my hair out. Um, we actually do everything we can to find patients a dental provider. I know everybody on this call knows that there is. Um, a very much a shortage of dental providers for anyone on Medicaid, but particularly fee for service. Uh, we maintain a database of dentists across the state. In fact, some of our telephone people physically every three months or so go through the phone book and call every dentist in the state to see if they will take fee for service and keep a database. Um, and then I actually am working closely with uh, Dr. Bruce Austin, who is the um, Oregon Health Authority Dental um, uh, uh, Director, and with his work and working with the legislature, he's been able to get an increase 
in payment for fee for service dental services. It's better, but it's it, it's still difficult because it wasn't much of an increase. The legislator only gave a three percent increase, and um, and so unfortunately, uh, it's still a problem. But we are working as hard as we can on it. We're, we um, try very hard to get in front of the elected representatives and senators to talk about what we do and to talk about the, the need for better dental funding. So um, I, I, I wish we were doing, I wish we could do more, but we're doing everything that we can and we're continuing to advocate um, for the fee-for-service population. Um, Lexi asked, is there a way to identify if a patient is already being case managed by Keepro? Um, yes. You want to get my voice a break? Yeah, so, of course. Great question, Lexi. So again, what we do with um, other agencies that we work with is they will send an email, say, you know, we have this individual, this is circumstance, can you verify whether or not they're in case management and or assign the case management to them. So again, if you send me an email, I'm able to look that up in the system, and that's usually the best way for us to identify. And if someone does have a particular need that you as a community partner have identified, then providing us with that background information allows us to move to the next step for case management. All right, let's go ahead and continue to the next slide. This is an awesome group of questions. Yeah, again, just exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so the so these are just um, I think we uh, our discussion is much better than me just reading you the slide. But this is just an example of some of the care coordination strategies we use. Um, I, I like to point out in-home medication reconciliation um, because uh, our members and humans in general are not good about knowing what medications they're supposed to be taking. Um, what medicines they have in their home, um, et cetera. This is not unique to the Medicaid population. This is this just humans. Um, and you know, a, a best case scenario, maybe one third to one half of people actually take their medication as prescribed. So when nurses go into the home and actually open the medication cat, the med cabinet with patients and go through them, it's amazing what the interactions and the, what they'll learn and what they can teach the, the individual members. And if you, if you actually could get medication compliance in all members, the readmission rate to hospitals would drop by 40 to 50%. There's actually been studies that have shown that. So, so I harp on that a lot. Um, and we've talked a bit about interacting with uh, case manager services with DHS, APD, um, MFCU, et cetera. Uh, we're heavily involved in transitions of care from hospital to home or hospital to nursing facility to home. Um, and, and then the last one I wanted to point out is that we have a robust fall prevention program. And as I know you appreciate, uh, falls are responsible for a lot of morbidity in the United States, a lot of hospitalizations. Um, and so many of them can be prevented. You know, the extension cord across that runs across the middle of the living room floor. You know, it's a lot of these things can be done. Um, as we learn more about our patients and find out the different conditions they have, then we can focus on diagnosis specific care. So we're going to go to the next slide. And here's some service examples. And this is where I was going to turn it over to Maggie. Okay, That's okay. Sure. Um, and she's just going to run through things and this. This is where I'll bet you'll have even more questions. Right, the next slide. Oh, great. So I think um, some of the services that we provide is we have access to a language link where we have 140 different languages that we're able to help facilitate. Um, and uh, for those that prefer other than English, and that's available at any time, first during our regular hours, as well as after hours through our nurse advice line. And as Jeff mentioned, the nurse advice line is available to anyone who calls. So even though an individual may have CCO coverage, we never turn someone away if they've called for a nurse. We make sure that they connect to a nurse. And I might just add that, it, I didn't put it on the slide, that it, it, with the exception of very rare languages, uh, the wait time for getting an interpreter is really short. It's usually less than one minute. 
right? Except for, again, except for very rare languages as, as you can probably appreciate. And we realize this is um, small, but it provides an overview of, you know, what Jeff was just saying in terms of our average call length and uh, the types of and the numbers of calls that we've helped facilitate in different languages. So. I have a question for Sure. You. Oh, so the question is, does any of this apply to members who are in residential treatment for A and D? So that would fall under our ITA QA. Just do you want to? Um, so the the short answer is yes, um, and we the IQA, our independent qualified agent, the behavioral health arm of our uh, local office, would initially be involved with that. Uh, person and then we'll reach out usually via Maggie but reach out to our nurse case managers to provide the type of services we were just talking about so so yeah we we can do that so other services that are available and these are just some of the examples so we always have what we call a, a nod or a nurse of the day so there's always a nurse that's available in the office um, because remember our other nurses are all field-based. So we always have someone that's assigned. So if at any time a call comes in and it's not a call that needs nursing advice, but they might have some questions about um, just their case management in general, then we're always able to uh, quickly bring a nurse on the line to talk with that individual and then connect them with their own case manager or to help facilitate them moving into case management. Um, we do a series of assessments uh, as part of the case management program. It actually starts on that very first call to the member when we do that outreach where we ask them some very basic questions about do you have a primary care physician? If not, how can we help you uh, uh, connect and get scheduled with a primary care physician? Do you have an advanced directive? We have a strong belief that everyone should at least have some information on advanced care planning. We talk about, have you had your flu vaccine? Um, are you smoking? Are you interested in not smoking? And then try to put you in line with the appropriate services such as through the quit line. So um, some of the assessments that we do, we do an acute intervention, we do that initial intervention assessment that I just mentioned, and we also look at health literacy so we can understand what is the level of um, understanding for the individual, which allows us then to tailor our communications appropriately. We help to facilitate medical transport, to coordinate medical appointments, um, we provide educational materials and newsletters on a regular basis. Um, Jeff mentioned the use of action plans. The nurses, through part of that assessment process, will provide action plans. For example, one might be around an individual with pediatric asthma. So the parents have some particular guidelines they can actually post that said these are kind of the key points to watch for, and if there's an emergency, these are um, some of the actions you can take. And then again, we provide individualized and very customized case management. There's no cookie cutter that's used. We really like to and want to tailor it so it's um, person-centered and member-driven, and so working with that. So um, Jeff? Yeah, I was just gonna add, I wish I had included in the slides a picture of one of those action plans because oh. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, but they're, they're they're very easy to see they're like red yellow and green and um, you know when to get help the asthma is a perfect example when you this is when you go to the ER this is when you call the doctor this is when you call us um, and so I wish I had brought that because it would have gone a long way the health literacy thing I know that's something we're all concerned about we assess it now, we're constantly looking at better ways to assess that. The Oregon Medical Association actually just recently released um, a really good publication on health literacy. Um, and uh, so, we, which you can get on their website for free. But I'm, I'm looking right now at ways to incorporate some of the strategies in that report into our day-to-day -day activities. 
because um, as you all probably well know that the whole idea of looking at health literacy and intervening is, is pretty new. It shouldn't be new, but it is. And so, uh, so there's a lot of trial and error in what, what, um, what works and what doesn't. So Ruby has a great question. Uh, um, can members opt into care management or should they wait for that if a, it's identified either through a community partner or if the member feels they need or want a case manager and they haven't yet been outraged, absolutely connect with us because um, the sooner we're able to intervene, we feel the better uh, likelihood of um, successful outcome. Jeff mentioned, you know, we have pre-manage, for example. So every morning the nurses go online into pre-manage and identify anyone who's been admitted to the hospital who's under fee-for-service, and the nurses look within their geographic area so that we can identify a potential high-risk members um, who need some immediate care transition assistance. So we're able to provide that. Um, another way that we outreach is if a member calls on the nurse advice line, there is a follow-up by a nurse within 24 hours to that call. That allows us to make sure of two things. Is the member doing okay after their call for advice? And is there a need for case management depending on what the issue might have been? So, great question. Um, the next one, question. You want to give your voice a break and I take Okay, that. Jeff. Can I so Rachel that? asked if a member is a CCO member and going into residential care, the coverage has changed to fee-for-service. Can they get transportation to the facility with fee-for-service? So the answer is yes. Um, the, the more in-depth answer is it depends on when the person is changed to fee-for-service. If, if, I know that sounds weird, but if he's CCO till he hits the door at the facility and then becomes fee for service, he still gets transportation, but it's paid for by the CCO and they must pay for it regardless of what they say. Um, if the person is fee for service before they hit the door, then we can help arrange that transportation and it is covered as medical transportation. Um, and then Olivia asked if we use pre to identify if a case manager is involved with a member. Um, actually, yes. So not, not only do we use pre to know when somebody's been admitted, right. but then as patients are admitted and involved with a case manager, we log that into pre -manage. And so um, the, if, if there's somebody who is being followed by, well, we used Joanna as an example earlier. So if Joanna's following somebody, and he gets admitted to St. Charles in Bend, she gets a text message on her cell phone that says uh, your patient, you know, actually it doesn't say any names. It says one of your patients was admitted to St. Charles Bend, please go to pre-manage to see who that is uh, right. so that it you know, protects the health information. So I just wanna to add to that. So um, another example of that is, so each of the nurses has their cohort built in pre-manage that Jeff just described. But it may be someone like we have, Lucy is one of our case managers who oversees our hepatitis um, C program, which is a specialty program. She also has her cohort built. So if one of her members goes to the emergency department and or goes into the hospital, then she's also alerted. So we make sure it's just not all, only those admissions, but it could be a hospital um, emergency department. Well. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I didn't say the emergency department. Uh, Rachel's asking, is there a brochure we can print with this information? And I'm thinking she's asking that about transportation um, since that was her last question. So, um, oh, all of everything. Okay. So, um, the transportation issue, we've usually referred to the um, the OHA administrative rule books for transportation, but I know that's not a brochure that is that is user friendly for our members. Um, you know, that's it would be really nice to have a brochure that said everything. Uh, our we welcome have, package we have a generic, is we have a very generic brochure, but I don't know. It's if it generic, but details. it doesn't go into details. Right. This is why I like these kinds of uh, uh, presentations. I wrote it down. Yeah. So. <laughs> So I really appreciate that feedback. <laughs> well, don't say yeah, yeah, we haven't done it, but it will work, but that's a very good suggestion. 
All right. So next slide. Sorry. Oh, so you've talked about. We actually did a lot of this, didn't we? we yeah. We did. So we're again. Um, we have this weekly eligibility file. We identify through direct referral. You know, from members who call, from providers who uh, call, you know, call from discharge planners. We have been doing increasing amounts with the agencies we talked about, both APD and Medical Fragile Children. And then, of course, any of you would be able to call and or send an email. Email's a little easier because you can provide um, information about the individual and particularly their ID number, if we have their ID number, and we can begin to um, clue them in. If you are from a DHS OHA domain, so um, <clears throat> for your email, it's actually encrypted at the server level, so you don't have to send it secure. Um, Keypro and OHA have worked it out, so it's encrypted there, so all of our communication and email about members is confidential. So with our, compliance. Great. So with our partners, we have they do have access to it's our secure server, but it's an external leg of that. So they can they should all know how to send a secure email. Perfect. Oh, great. And so Perfect. absolutely would need to do that if you're including any client information. Exactly. You guys all well yeah. well know. So mm -hmm. and then we've mentioned about how we outreach. We every member has a variety of different assessments from that initial assessment to an acute intervention um, to more of the chronic disease um, types of assessments, the action plans we've mentioned, and of course, the interventions that come with case management. <clears throat> so we love challenges. <laughs> um, I was a former complex and end of life case manager. So, and our nurses, many of them have all been critically care trained and are very used to both community um, health as well as those uh, the sickest of the sick, if you will. So we're happy to help uh, with any unmet needs um, for this population. We actively coordinate with hospitals, clinics, agencies that we've mentioned. And so you may have some particular challenges you want to ask us about today. I want to just maybe give you an example of um, a case that happened um, actually it was in our Portland metro area, but I think it was just to kind of demonstrate some of the challenges. We had a fellow who um, wasn't that terribly old, um, was however homeless, but he did have a motorhome he lived in with out-of-date tags, so he couldn't really take it anywhere. He developed uh, cancer, um, our case, he was also very hard of hearing, and that comes into play with some of his visits. Our case manager um, helped to facilitate him getting uh, a, referred to a oncologist to have his um, case worked up, identified what his needs were, worked with the hospital to have him be able to park his motorhome on their campus so that he could have a place close to the hospital for his visits. He actually <clears throat> was late for a outpatient service, and the hospital called the case manager. No one could find him, and she knew where his uh, motor coach was parked, and he had collapsed in the motor coach, and she was able to facilitate getting care um, to him, getting him into the emergency room where he could be cared for. She went to virtually all of his physician oncology visits because he couldn't hear very well. And this was a lovely soft-spoken oncologist who actually Jeff knows well. Yeah. And so she was name. able to be <laughs> like his set of ears and help him. Um, sadly, he his cancer was um, advancing and she actually was able to help in moving him to those transitionary steps and was with him uh, at the point of his
So it looks like there were some audio problems a second ago. So if you missed anything, just please ask a question. And it looks like there are some yeah, questions. questions. Ellen. Hello, Ellen. <laughs> we were just bragging about you. Oh, Ellen, you're everywhere. Okay, so Ellen says, with a few exceptions, all OHP members are required to be in a CCO. Yes, when members who do not otherwise have an exemption to be open card and want to be on open card, can Keypro help with member requests to be open card? Um, let me start, and Maggie may add some stuff too. So, okay. so we can help. We can't always succeed, um, but but we can help make a case for patients or members to become open card. And when we can make that case is when an individual needs care from providers or some services or facilities that are only available through open card or the ability for them to work all together is only available with open card. So it turns out that when these cases come up, they often are cancer cases, not unlike what Maggie was talking about. Um, and continuity of care is important with everything. I, I, I'm actually a cancer doctor, and so I, I say, of course, it's important with cancer, but it's important with other things too. But if you start out with one oncologist, you need to stay with that oncologist till you're done with with your treatment and post treatment surveillance. So if, if somebody comes on as fee for service and ends up with an oncologist who isn't in a CCO, then we can make an argument to, for that person to stay um, fee for service. We've had a couple of folks um, who are very complicated, like from the um, the MFCU population, where we just couldn't meet all we meaning the state of Oregon couldn't meet all their needs being in a CCO right. and have transferred to fee for service. Um, Maggie, you may want to add to that. Hopefully that answers your question, Ellen. Yeah, I think it really goes back to the case by case basis and that's why it's important for us to have the conversation and to determine what the needs and the issues are and then uh, are being able to advocate with the state in point you on that. Good. So Mark, what a great question. So Mark asks, in the case of a client who does not have a working phone or a consistent home address in Tillamook County, how soon could they possibly meet in person with a nurse? Um, so Mark, if you send me an email, you'll see my email address. Let's um, identify a little bit more information. We can certainly, um, depending on you know the other patient, um, I think needs or requirements, we can certainly have a nurse, you know, usually out geographically. We don't have one specifically housed in Tillamook County, but we have one that is assigned to Tillamook County. And so usually, you know, within at least 24 to 48 hours. We work with a lot of homeless individuals in our patient population. And that's where cocooning them and looking at other agencies and working with the county becomes so um, important, but also working with nonprofit and um, agencies or entities in the community. Um, we've also done work with, um, why can't I think of the name, Jeff, of the, the line, where we are able to plug them into a, a phone, an emergency phone service, and I, it's escaping me, and I apologize right now. So that we, the one fellow, in fact, that we described, the, yeah, right. When, and I said, but there's another name for that oh, there's phone. And my staff always laughs because I can never remember it. But anyway, but the idea is that, you know, is it a matter of they need to get a phone, they don't have a phone, then we can tap into those kind of services and resources. Mm -hmm. So, so Mark, send me an email on that one. Uh, Lexi asked, is there any specific criteria to keep in mind when referring to Keypro? Really, the only criterion is if the person is fee for service. Otherwise, if there's a problem that there's a problem, get us involved. Um, if we can't help, there's a good possibility that we know somebody who can or an agency right. who can. So what what we don't want you to have to do is extra work. Um, we just want you to know we're here and and you can contact us again. The last slides can have all that. 
Uh, Patricia, so as an application assister, okay, so Patricia's asking as an application assister, when we have a client who just qualified for OHP through, through ONE? It's our um, eligibility system. system. Oh, okay. okay, I'm sorry, thank you. And have an urgent medical need. Is it my understanding that they can call a key pro person? Where can we find the number or call the OHA state client service and can the brochure emailed with the PowerPoint? It's, okay, it all does make sense, Patricia. So, um, as, as soon as you, as soon as a client has qualified, he or she can call us. Um, the no, we're going to show you the number at the end. We can get you the brochure, and um, I am sure that Colette would be happy to send out these slides to all of you. Yeah, and Patricia, I will, and just for everyone on the call, I will send out a copy of all the slides, um, general brochure that, that they have uh, have shared, and then, yes, certainly, we'll have all the contact information at the end of the presentation. Sorry, Rachel said I was mumbling and didn't say the question very well. Um, so the question Patricia asked was, um, as an application assister, when we have a client who just qualified for the Oregon Health Plan, through O-N-E and have an urgent medical need. Is it my understanding that they can call a key pro person? Where can we find the number or call the OHA state client services number? And can the brochure emailed with the PowerPoint at the end of the webinar? Um, hope this all makes sense. And so. So yes, that was a multi-part question. So we are <laughs> reading all portions of the question. Um, and Connor asked a really good question. Is yeah. there an online search for directory for open So, oh yeah, that so, is a great. So Connor asked, is there an online search or directory for open card members to find a provider PCP or do they have to call you? So we keep a resource database of providers who accept fee for service individuals. So our recommendation is to call the call center. So we have care coordinators who are experienced and can help facilitate um, locating a PCP. And personally, I think that's a lot easier than us sending something out. We really want to actively be part of that process with our members to help navigate the system. You know, I, I always think back to how many individuals who come on um, insurance that may never have navigated the system. It just has, it's a, it's been, it's a luxury in many ways for these individuals now and it's had to think about that. But being able to help navigate those that have never navigated the system before is a really, I think, strength that we bring to the population. And the other thing is we've gotten the question many times if we can provide a list of fee-for-service providers. And unfortunately, what we've run into is that that list changes very, very frequently. Yeah. So the fear is to put something out that will become outdated very quickly, which is why the service is also so so nice that it's available. Right. So, oh. so there is an online search directory and through the OHA's website, but for the reasons Rachel, uh, sorry, Colette just said, um, it, it's very difficult for OHA to keep it current. It, so our 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 uh, database may not be perfect, but it is more current. Just because we're dealing with it daily. So I think I, one of the things I want to talk um, before the next question, going back to addressing kind of unmet, meet, unmet needs, is number one, it's assured wireless. So I passed my senior moment. <laughs> Actually, I looked back at my notes. And we um, not only help coordinate, but we will help facilitate care conferences with multiple entities, particularly on these really complex cases. Um, in fact, we were just on one, we have a neonate that was um, born, has multiple complex needs before they can move out for placement and bringing in all the important care providers, not only at the hospital, but um, through MS, this was an MSCU baby, and then also through the local community resources to make sure their placement is going to be safe for them. And then we, so we would do those on an ad hoc basis where we can, what we call staff that particular case. But then every two weeks, the case managers, we have active meetings. We actually have Skype meetings so we can see each other. And we will do a case review of what we call those red flags or high risk cases that we're able to review. So 
So it looks like there, I know there was at least one more question before our wrap up. Yeah, we will definitely um, run through the questions. Okay. I was thinking maybe we could just share yes. this kind of last maybe two slides. Yeah, it? there's two. Okay. So here's the information on contacting us. Um, you can call anytime. This number gets you to the call center. So for example, if you want to talk with me, um, you can ask that it be put through to me. But they're able to help facilitate um, any basic and general questions. As well, as well as helping to identify a possible case manager. Sherry Kellams is our um, case management supervisor and she's in the office, so she's able to assist in identifying, particularly around that geographic area. Um, and we've already talked about just asking general questions and then contacting our nurse advice line, which is 24 seven, they're available. That's the website Jeff mentioned previously for information. And we really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. I know we have a series of additional questions. Um, here are the email addresses for both of us. Feel free, anyone, to send us a message, um, and we'll get back to you mm -hmm. and attempt our best to answer your question or to find the answer for your question. So. All right. So another, back to the question box. Okay, so the question is, if I have a, um, this is from Saini, if, um, hopefully I said your name correctly. If I have a dual eligible client who my provider would like to refer, how do you guys coordinate with the patient and the PCP? Do you have a provider portal? Great questions. Um, so what we do if, if you told us about this, this member or the member called us or the PCP called us, um, and as you know, the dual eligible folks are um, eligible for everything that we do, uh, we would contact the member first, and then if this member is fortunate and has a PCP, right. we, we would contact the PCP and uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page as far as what things to do to help um, improve that person's health. Today, we don't have a provider portal, but hopefully soon we will. Um, we're in the process of changing our electronic record system from something that um, is kind of archaic, but still looks good compared to MMIS, sorry, um, <laughs> but something that's archaic to something that's much more 21st century where providers would be able to interact. Right. Right. But today we don't have that. We've, we've uh, been pushing hard to get that implemented. We know what it's gonna be. Just, um, there's a lot of bureaucracy in corporate America too. And so <laughs> it, has to, it hasn't happened yet. But we have a project planning meeting. <laughs> later today. Actually, that's true. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're meeting about that not long after this. Um, Teresa asked, are individuals that have eligibility through the hospital presumptive eligibility process able to access assistance through this service? Yes. Yeah, it's to, it, to us, the hospital presumptive eligibility is the same as being fee for service. Correct, correct. I can take that next one. Okay, good. Um, Question from Lexi, did you mention earlier you work in the field and over the phone? So yes, we have a combination. Our nurses and are geographically located and our social workers are also available in the field. So we do and we will do both field visits, but we also do telephonic support and uh, as part of those processes. Because sometimes you, particularly with some of these really complex cases where you're reaching out to a multitude of different people, um, being able to do that on the phone is often most effective, just from a time. Perspective. Yeah, and, and we have members who, who get a phone call every day. Right. So um, it, again, me, meeting well, whatever need they example. have. You know, you could mention that the hepatitis C program. Oh, do you wanna talk about briefly about that? But, yeah, just so you know, we have a, a program that I'm excited about because it's it's we've had it for a little over, well, almost two years now. Um, but it's it's a great example of of a government and a private corporation and an academic institution working together. And uh, we created a program with the Oregon Health Authority, Kipro, and the Oregon State University School of Pharmacy to 
case manage people who have fever service who are getting these new hepatitis C drugs that if you're not familiar with, you've seen advertisements on the news every five minutes, every single night. Um, and these, these drugs are great though. I mean, they, they really are putting people into remission with hepatitis C. They might even be a cure. It's too early to know that. But they're very, very expensive and they're worth it as long as they are taken regularly. So it turns out that the biggest uh, factor that contributes to whether or not a person responds to hepatitis C treatment is whether or not he or she took the medication every day. And so we interact with our people getting these drugs every day and just say, take your pill. And then it gives us an opportunity to see how they're doing with side effects early in the treatment. There could be side effects that, that sometimes can be hard for patients. Um, there could be some mood swings in that that happen. And, and um, if we can get them over that speed bump, um, then we, we usually the, the side effects get better and the uh, kind of mood swings in that can go away. Um, and so we, we have a nurse who calls these people every day and um, they get to know one another. And sometimes other things come up. Um, you know, sometimes their diabetes becomes a problem and Luciana already knows them and can take care of that. Really great questions, you guys. Yeah. Um, we are on our final slide, so do let us know if you have any other questions. So far, we ha haven't seen any additional questions come in after Lexi's, um, but we can wait for a moment or two to see if other questions come in. Thank you all for your engagement and interactions. Yeah. This makes it so much more fun than just, <laughs> yeah. just speaking at a conference phone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and Colette, as I mentioned to you, I not very long ago had a provider say, well, I wished fee-for-service individuals had case management. Yeah. And I just want to you know, reassure everyone they do, and it's very active, and we have a very robust program that um, I know our nurses and our social workers are very proud of. And, and I think we've really seen some tremendous success stories mm -hmm. with some of the members that we've worked with, mm -hmm. whether it's you know, transitioning to home or finding them a place where they can be and or transitioning them at the end of life. We've been able to cover the continuum, like, as I like to say, from the birth of those individuals till their passing when it's appropriate. So. Yeah, and um, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, our, our first priority is getting people the health care they need, even though we get involved with prior authorizations, where our job is not to deny care to people. Our job is to get people the, the proper care that they need. Um, and it's amazing when we do that, people have better outcomes. And honestly, um, it, it saves money too and, and improves people's quality of life. So you know, we've actually been a, a key pro, has been a great investment for the people of the state of Oregon. Over the last five years that I've been doing this, uh, uh, we have, returned a, a, a return on investment the business people like to talk about of about 20 million dollars so so you know, basically for every dollar the people of oregon have put into this program we've been able to save them 20 dollars um, so so it's pretty it's pretty amazing to see that happen and we're just getting lots of positive feedback. So thanks you guys so much for your kind words. I know it was a treat to have um, Maggie and Jess here today. So uh, really appreciate all the interaction and all of your guys' great questions. So we will have a few, I'll have a few follow-up items. So I'll make sure to send you all of those additional materials. Um, so thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, well, it looks like we are all done uh, with questions. So thanks again and have a great day. Um, one last thing for those of you that are routinely participating in the provider collaborative webinars, I will send an additional email, a separate email with an invitation soon to our April provider collaborative, which will be our second session on Reproductive Health Equity Act, AKA House Bill 3391. So we'll jump back into that topic as there are many changes coming in April. Thanks again. Ending the webinar for all. Have a great day.